Welcome to Ames Public Library, both in person and virtually for Genealogy Plus, a program brought to you through a partnership with Ames Public Library and the Story County Genealogical Society. I'm Megan Klein Hewitt, Adult Services Manager at Ames Public Library. The library's mission is to connect you to the world of ideas, which we do through diverse and inclusive resources and programming like today's event. This event is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube channel after the fact. Uh, if you get bumped out of this Zoom meeting, please just follow the original link back and you'll be able to get right back into the session. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation, but questions are also welcome at any time. So if you are on Zoom, you can put your questions in the chat, but you can also unmute and ask your questions aloud if you prefer. Uh, and with that, please welcome Diana Shonrock. Good morning, everyone. I feel like um, as I get ready to start this um, presentation, it's like in a world long, long ago, and and I uh, did a lot of work. Twenty, I spent twenty years working on the Iowa Community Cookbook Collection, and we'll talk a little bit about it. But mostly, I'm going to talk about how food and and affects uh, um, your uh, who we are, who we've become how it affects our history. Um, so um, I'm going to start from there. And I decided to call this Preserving, Preserving Traditions from the Kitchen. Um, Iowa's local history, um, how it affects the way we've grown and how we've become who we are and what we eat. And so um, by all means, um, this is one of those things that uh, be has become sort of a part of me, and you're going to find out toward the end is um, is sort of an archive, which makes me feel some days sort of like an archive. But here's what you can find, and here's what you can work with, and maybe you're not even interested, depending on where your genealogy work leads you, in Iowa, and I'll show you that there are other of these collections in other states that you should be taking a look at. So without further ado, I think, preserving tradition from the kitchen. Hello. I don't really want that up there. It's going, well, okay. Um, history in the kitchen started a long time ago. This picture actually is from the Iowa State University archives. And um, it looks much like any test kitchen probably did at the turn of the century. And one of the things you should kind of think about as we talk about the history of food and the development of food, in, and it applies in most states, is that around the turn of the century, um, people started looking at food as a science, believe it or not, as opposed to only something that you did in the kitchen at home. So, uh, is there any way to move this, these, bo these picture boxes? Because they're over, the, they're over the words in my presentation. Kitchen is the heart of the home, evokes memories of family and tradition. Um, think about the time you spent um, at the table at home and probably maybe, still spend at the table at home with your kids, with your grandparents, with your parents. Um, lots of time to talk, if there is talk these days and you could get people to put their electronic devices on the table, um, is, is about food and about what you're eating and how, why is that what you're eating or who ordered what even at a restaurant. And so, what kinds of things are you talking about and looking about? Um, our collection, I mean, food is first, ethnic origins of food. You're gonna to have to give me a second because the all of the, 
Zoom stuff has moved to the top of the screen and I don't want it there. I can't read the headings on my screens. Megan, are you there? Okay. Um, ethnic origin, who we are, how our food changed, how our food adapted. Lots of times when people look at their family cookbooks, they'll put in grandma's version of something and then they'll put in the, the version that they're using now. How have the food products changed? What was going on in history when, um, when you did, when that food, when that recipe was written down? I mean, what kinds of things affected it? There was the, the we've had, we had in, in the 1900s, we had two world wars, we had the depression, we had baby boom, all, and we had women going back to work. All of those things have had an effect on the food that we eat and how we prepare it. Um, the roots of the Iowa State Collection included to begin with um, a donation from a man named Robert Smith, who I'll talk about a little bit in a minute. Um, some cookbooks from the estate of Ruth Ellen Church, who was Mary Mead and, a, and the food editor for the Chicago Tribune. Um, we had miscellaneous donations over the years and um, we used money from things we couldn't have, we couldn't use when we, to sell them. Um, and we would use the money to purchase new things for the um, collection. And there was a monetary donation from a woman named Gladys Hertzberg in the 1990s um, to digitize some of those cookbooks into electronic formats and to do kitchen clatter. So we'll talk about kitchen clatter for those of you who are familiar with it. And if not, I'll talk a little more about it later. Um, the other part of the collection was I did a lot of begging. Um, I spoke at a lot of meetings. I talked to a lot of um, different groups about the Iowa cookbook collection. And uh, I, I literally said, talk to your, your neighbor, talk to your mother, talk to your grandmother. What kinds of things might they have that they were considering throwing out that they might throw out to the Iowa cookbook collection? Um, from the very beginning, the emphasis of the collection was on Iowa cookbooks. And we talked, and it included things from Iowa food companies like um, Quaker Oats and Amana and so forth. Also an emphasis on the Iowa, the strength of the Iowa State collections um, and their programs, such as um, the domestic arts and home economics, quantity food preservation, um, and books that came from all kinds of organizations and families across the state. Community cookbooks, where they did their town history and they, and they made a cookbook to sell, to raise money. Um, organization cookbooks, um, Iowa companies, historical cookbooks, uh, families did cookbooks. I keep wanting to do one of my own, but I don't know where to stop. So maybe I, I need to sit and, and do it. Um, there were two really large groups that began the collection. One of them came from a man named Robert Smith. And the second came from Ruth Ellen Church, who was a Chicago food writer. And it was continued by other things. Um, we identified them in newspapers. We identified them. Um, we got them from companies. We requested them from all sorts of places at that early point in time. The um, all kinds of um, cookbooks centered on Iowa companies, Iowa restaurant cookbooks. Uh, cookbooks from institutions and radio stations. And we picked up all kinds of ephemera, all those little pamphlets and hang tags 
that come with your Amana mixer or microwave oven. We used all of those things as part of our collection. And it actually is, after about five years of begging, it finally became something that was identified in the ISU catalog with a series title, Iowa Cookbook Collection. So you can actually go online at the Iowa State University Library homepage and type in Iowa Cookbook Collection, and it will give you the entire list of everything that's been cataloged with that um, series title. So here he is. This is the beginning, Robert Smith. I never ever will forget the day in my life when I answered the phone, 1992, and the voice on the other end of the phone said, I have 12,000 cookbooks, do you want them? I had to stop. I, I didn't have a clue if I wanted them. I didn't know what I would do with them. And so I said to him, well, what kind of cookbooks are they? And he said, well, that other university didn't want them. And I said, okay. Um, so we talked a while and probably we talked an hour and then I had to go kind of get permission to even consider this idea. So I went to the head of collections and tried to explain what he had said to me and then called him back and said, well, could we come and take a look at this collection? And he said, oh, sure. So the next weekend, it was off to, or the next week, actually, it was a Monday. It was off to what cheer Iowa to meet Mr. Robert Smith. Um, the collection of things that we found was on the second story of his garage. He had a huge building and it had two stories. He used he put cars in his shop in the lower level. And um, <clears throat> up above, dusty cement blocks you can visualize here um, with planks running from cement block to cement block and then layer upon layer um, as tall as I was at least then and um, every kind of in no order exactly every kind of thing you could imagine every kind of cookbook there were paperbacks there were hardbacks there were old books there were new books um, there were probably plenty of duplicate books. And then there was a five a huge um, container full of all these loose things like the little tiny cookbooks that come from Jello and Amana and Sunbeam and whatever. And they were all in a big barrel, just in the barrel. And so um, collection head, the archives head and I looked at it and then we had another discussion the next weekend or the next week actually, because I was going to graduate school at the time. Um, and he, we decided that what we could do is we could decide, we could set up um, a collection and keep only the things that were related archivally to the state of Iowa. So we sent boxes and we took everything with the agreement that we could get rid of anything we didn't want from the 12,000 items. We didn't really count them, but it was awful. So um, they were all, they all came back to Iowa State. They were all fumigated. And we very quickly went through them and picked out some things we knew we didn't need and had a book sale um, before Christmas. And so from September to December, we had taken care of all that much of it. And then um, we started picking out the things that met the policy that I wrote um, for the collection. And so, um, that's kind of um, that's kind of a uh, a quick overview of what that part of the collection was, and then we spent 
any number of years, finally picking out the final items that we would actually add to the Iowa State collection. And the things that were older, we added to Iowa State archives. So, and then almost the same time, actually the same fall, I got another phone call this one from Carter Church, who was the son of Ruth Allen Church, who wrote under the pen name of Mary Mead. But Ruth Allen was an ISU graduate in food science and nutrition in 1933. And she was the food editor for the Chicago Tribune for 40 years. Um, in 1962, she became the nation's first wine columnist. She developed one of the first newspaper test kitchens, and we have about a thousand volumes um, from her collection, including things that were that she wrote. And sadly, the reason that her son was calling me in 1992 was that someone had murdered her in her home when she was home alone um, earlier in that year, and so they were they were cleaning out her um, office and offering these materials, which made it kind of sad, but it fit in at the time. The other thing that happened along the way as I was gathering this stuff is I got lots and lots of letters from, it's easy for me to say now, older people, mostly women, um, and I couldn't help using some of them. And so this one is from a, an Iowa State grad from the early turn of the century years. And it says, I was the oldest girl of seven children, so I learned to cook at a very early age. Some of you can, can think about yourselves in this picture. My mother was a wonderful cook. I learned by watching her. By the time I was 10 years old, I learned to bake bread. And that was the beginning of my love of cooking and baking. I had saved many of mother's recipes while growing up, and I tried to collect recipes for the 48 years of my married life. And she too had put together one of those community cookbooks and hers includes lots of memories of her growing up years and how these recipes came to be part of her life, how she developed, how she worked with them and changed them. And so this letter came in 2001 after the collection had been going on for about nine years. But it was always interesting and I always enjoyed getting these kinds of letters and then making the follow-up phone calls. Um, these are the kind of things when you look at your own ethnic materials, your own genealogy materials, is what do you have from your mom or your grandma um, where they've written their own handwritten little notes um, when my grandma died, I wasn't smart enough yet to know that I should save all of those things. Um, I hadn't come to that part of my life. I had just barely gotten married. And uh, to this day, I pulled some pages out of my grandma's um, three ring binder notebook that she put all her, her recipes in. And, and I have about a dozen or more pages in her hand. And, I, and I, I keep knocking myself over the head that I didn't keep the rest of that cookbook, which was really just her collection of recipes. You know, cookbook can be described that way. It's, it's just somebody's collection and how did they put it together? One of the other things that I decided to do when I put this collection together was to put together a background collection of historic American cookbooks that could sort of create the foundation for the Iowa cookbook collection. And I did it by picking historic cookbooks that kind of were written in the same um, vein as the cookbooks that you might find in community cookbooks. And several of these people um, and their cookbooks are well known if you're if you have any interest in historical cookbooks. And uh, we have digitized these collect these items, most of them, 
and they're on in the Iowa State collection, but they're available other places. Um, I would tell you that all of the used book dealers in the world now have my email address, and every time they have a used cookbook that they think I might want, they they let me know, but I, mostly they're like out of my price range at this point. Um, Eliza Smith wrote The Complete Housewife and is considered the first American cookbook author. Um, Amelia Simmons was well known for a book that came out turn of the century called American Cookbook, American Cookery. Some of you may know the settlement cookbook that comes out of Chicago. Um, you may not think about this one, but here is a familiar name. Ella, Ella Kellogg wrote something called Science in the Kitchen. And then you probably, if you're a cook at all, have a copy of some edition of The Joy of Cooking. As I said, this is what part of the first cookbook published in, in America. Um, it's really difficult to read it if you have it in hand. I have a, a reprint of it. Um, really the unusual spellings that came from um, Old English. It includes not only recipes, and a, and a lot of cookbooks do this, but popular home remedies, and even things like directions for painting a room. There are only six known copies of the Williamsburg edition, and we have a copy of the later one. We don't have that one. Um, American Cookery, facsimile, the first American cookbook from Amelia Simmons. It too has a very small number of things and was first identified as A. Simmons because women didn't write things in that age. And so it was very difficult to get your name on something. Um, the Way to a Man's Heart. <laughs> this is the Milwaukee Church Charity Cookbook. Um, the 1991 reprint sold over 2 million copies. And in case you think selling ads in your community cookbook is new, this one had 174 pages of ads, so nothing's new. And then Science in the Kitchen, published in 1893. Mrs. Kellogg did a book on health and diet and nutrition. So the history is there. You will see some of this in some of the old cookbooks that you may have. Um, it was, came out from the, the Seven Day Adventists was because they had founded this Health Reform Center and the Kellogg's were a big part of this particular um, reform. There were hundreds of recipes and I would tell you that if you looked at them, they are very, very bland by today's standards. And that's true of a lot of recipes. I think one of the things that I remember a lot is that I cooked with my mom for years and my grandma, but the food didn't have much seasoning. It was salt and pepper. And when I went away to college and had first worked in food kitchens and um, food labs, the things I began to bring home to my mom that she still uses today, by the way, she's 97 on Saturday. Um, but the kinds of things that I brought home were all of those Italian spices like basil and and tarragon and so on. And so we sort of learned together to cook with those things. And I still do a lot of, I pick up a recipe and then I start playing because I, I always want to think that it's going to have a flavor. And then the joy of cooking, we actually own a copy of the first edition some of the money we got from that original book sale allowed us to buy some things for the collection that were historical. Um, and in, in this case, we found, I found um, a copy of the first edition and um, we purchased it. So 
if you have joy of cooking as your way or time of going or getting things done, this is one of the things um, that you can think about is how these things are developed. Um, and the whether so whether you have joy of cooking or Betty Crocker or you have better homes, all of those things have evolved over time. And depending on which edition you have, you will find that the recipes vary to uh, more or less of an extent. And by the way, we do have all of the copy, all of the editions of the general Betty Crocker cookbook and the Better Homes cookbook and a lot more Better Homes because that's an Iowa company. So what about the people behind the print? What kind of people were they? Well, the Iowa State Collection, one of the big movers and shakers of the day, that would be the turn of the century, was Mary B. Welch, who was the wife of the first president of Iowa State University, and also the first head of the Department of, there you go, Domestic Economy. So she was in that position until 1883. She was responsible for the first extension effort at a land grant university. And Iowa State obviously is still a, a large extension and uh, kind of university. She also began at Iowa State. She was the first person to put the focus on the science end of domestic economy. And her writings include a book, a textbook, published first in 1884, which is called Mrs. Welch's Cookbook. And it's a textbook. This is a picture of the front cover. You notice that the thumbnail up in the corner of all of my slides is, is done from that. It's the cover of that book. Um, lots and lots of things included in her copies. We actually own four copies of this because it's an Iowa State thing and it, people kind of give from what they have. And so people who actually were her students or are granddaughters of someone who was her student find these things in their collections and they donate them to the library. So that's where these came from, but this is from her original hand and this is her original copy and it has a lot of, of these kinds of notes. And the pages in the cookbook, because it was a textbook, I, su I suspect, um, leave lots of blank pages so that you can write um, things in the cookbook. And then this is another, I didn't meet Leanna, but I did spend a, a lot of time with her, her uh, daughter, Marguerite in Shenandoah, Iowa, and uh, her granddaughter. And I have a lot of the things that have come to the collection related to uh, KMA radio and two kitchen platter came out of what we have from this family and photographs from our archival collection. This is, she had an automobile accident. And uh, so she did most of her work from her radio uh, in a station, had, they set up a station for her at home. And uh, so this is her like work table that we have here. And kitchen platter, which began in the 1940s. We have all of the issues and uh, you can search them. You can print out pages. You can print out recipes. You can search for your favorite recipe if you want to. Um, all kinds of things that were included in it. And they are related to the radio show. And the first five volumes were actually mimeographed things, not printed, as been sent to a printer to print and mail, but rather um, just like rolled off a mimeograph machine and put in envelopes. And when they realized how many people wanted to have copies of these things, they gradually decided by the fifth volume that they had to do something. And so this is from the first actual printed issue. 
you do have some copies of the some of the Mimeo stuff, but the, I, it doesn't really look like what if you know kitchen platter you think of. And both Leanna and she was one of five sisters. This is her sister Jessie, whose last name, married name, is Young. They were all members of the Field family, as in Shenandoah had two crown families, the May family, as in Earl May, and the Field family. And so this is Jesse Field Young. And Jesse Field Young is known as the creator, the originator of uh, 4-H in Iowa. And she too published a magazine and hers was called The Homemaker. And so here are some examples of what that looks like. We also had a couple of celebrities in, in our overtime in our departments here. And one of them was Lenore Sullivan. So if you know everything, anything about what to serve for dinner, or food for 50, or some of those kinds of things. She was professor of institution management when that's what the department was called. And a lot of you probably know, and this is, this is the same thing. This is food history. Evelyn Berkby would be the first one, and I talked to her many times over the years when we were both working, um, would be the first one to say that your food history is something that you share with others, and you write down. And so she began collecting things from her readers or listeners, I guess I should say, and, and putting them together um, in something called Down a Country Lane was one of her books. She began her radio show in the late 1940s and it went on until the late 1980s. And uh, I was still in contact with her until well after the, the 2000s and we would have little chats about what she was doing. She was a hundred, if not quite. Um, print items in the collection itself. What is Iowa's food history? Well, it comes from lots of things. And, and the question is, is your food history written down or is it only, does it only exist on that recipe card in your recipe book and do you have people call you and say, my kids call and they say, so where is grandma's recipe for? Or where is great grandma's recipe for? Chicken and dumplings, kolachkis, all of those kinds of things. They get passed down, but it's, I keep telling them at some point you're responsible for this recipe because I can only tell you what I have. I can tell you what's changed. Um, so what kinds of things are in Iowa's food history? This is an, the oldest thing in our, uh, in our collection. It was published in 1902, and you'll know it was published by the Iowa Cemetery Association. And somebody said to me, why is someone publishing, why is the Cemetery Association publishing a cookbook? And I said, you obviously didn't grow up in Iowa because I don't know what happens at your house, but at my house when I was growing up and what I was had children. If somebody died, the first thing you did is put a casserole in the oven and uh, take it over to the family. So there'd be food to feed all the people who are gonna be coming for the funeral. I know a lot of that's changed, but to some extent, it still happens. And you'll notice all kinds of ads supporting the publishing of this cookbook. But the ads really were for things like tuna noodle casserole and scalp potatoes and in lard in, that you put in a pretty big pan. And claim to fame, um, we have a couple of copies of this original suffrage cookbook and uh, recipes with notes from the authors. This was sold to support the suffrage movement. And so it includes Carrie Chapman cat recipes, if you're interested in that. 
1903, the Ladies Auxiliary put this cookbook out. That's right. And then there was a time in the 90s when someone was doing cookbooks from all the best of the best from all the states. And so we have best of the best from Iowa. I had nothing to do with this. What is Iowa cookbook? What is our history? What is your history? What is cooking history? This is a lot of ethnic information that we keep from our families and they're gonna vary a lot, the kinds of things that are in them. But I thought you might be interested in some that are actually part of the collection. Here's one that, that I took fairly recently. It was done in the last five years. Um, the Tweet Family Cookbook from Roland Story um, did cookbooks with all kinds of things that they had from their, from their parents and grandparents. And it's loaded with family pictures and a lot of them of family eating pictures. And so these are the kinds of things, if you're thinking about doing something with your family recipes, these kinds of things are possible for you. This is one of my favorites. And this is, by the way, I think one of the best family cookbooks that I have the privilege to have and to add to the collection. This was done by the Graziano family who owned the grocery store. They still own the Graziano grocery store in Des Moines, by the way. And all of their Italian recipes are included in this and it's a lovely cookbook. Um, this one came from my hometown. It came for the 150th um, anniversary of Osage and Mitchell County and tried and true recipes from various cookbooks that had been done in Mitchell County over the years that they could find in the library and some new ones and then some pictures of buildings that had been there since the founding or going back nearly that far. So um, I'm not going to say a whole lot about Iowa State University because that's probably not where you're going to want to do your work. But because the collection itself is housed at the Iowa State University Library, I thought I would put do just a couple of slides and I'll go through them fairly quickly. I have on the handout that you have or will get, I'm not sure. Um, there are lots of, of uh, links to things that you might want to take a look at later that I don't have time to spend a lot of time on, but this is the home page, so to say, of the Iowa State University Library. And, and the catalog bar comes up right at the very top and you can type in whatever you want. I did Mrs. Welch's cookbook, but you can also see that if you wanna see, if you wanna search special things, there are digital, you can just go straight to digital collections. You can just go to archives homepage. Um, the digital repository is something totally different. It's something, where university papers are kept. And so you can look there. I suppose if you want it, if you have any interest in knowing what I wrote or any of my promotion and tenure papers or all that kind of junk, um, they're in the digital repository because somebody thinks that that's the way it should be kept. But something to think about. Um, this is what the archives homepage looks like when I collect, when I clicked on digital collections, and I can put in Iowa cookbook collection, um, all kinds of different collections and how they're kept. And you can notice over here at the bottom, it says archive it. And that's where the background pages are kept that go with the Iowa cookbook collection. And this is just a sample page of where the cookbooks themselves 
what it looks, what kinds of things you'll see. And you can click on any of these items and actually open these cookbooks. And this is what happens when you look for the collection, it brings up this page. And down here, it says Iowa Cookbook Collection. And it takes you to, these are the web pages that were created in probably the late 1990s to explain the Iowa Cookbook Collection to people who wanted to use it. And you'll notice over here on the left-hand side, there are any number of different um, headings. And these headings still work. They go to what were the web pages. They're just still, and they have not been updated. Uh, I recently made an offer to update the pages, and it's sort of under consideration. But these five lovely ladies are the five field sisters, in case you have any interest. And that's why their, their picture is plastered on this page, because down here is Kitchen Clatter Magazine. And they all had a role in writing the different columns for um, the magazine, even though Leanna was in charge of that project. Some of these things I said today, some of them I haven't about the history of what it is. But you can take a look at that and you'll see the history over here. Um, you, I said you could look up Iowa Cookbook Collection, just type it in and you can see the kinds of things that come up. Here's um, the 150th anniversary cookbook for Riceville and lots of pictures. I was, I was pretty picky about taking cookbooks from that were coming out new in that if they if they were going to publish it, that they had to have some kind of historical content to them. And so most of what's in our collection was chosen because it did have historical content along with being an Iowa cookbook. And, and it was a space issue more than anything. Um, kitchen clatter, beginning with volume six on, you can, and they each open individually. Pick, take your pick. And these, you can print these out. You can turn the pages one at a time. That's how, it, how it's set up to work. Um, it says a collection of cookbooks authored by, I'm trying to get him to change that because authored is a misnomer, not really having anything to do with it. Um, full text, if you actually just looked it up in the catalog, you can see it says full text available. And it comes up cover and you can see the pages down the side here. You can page through it. You can look at the table of contents and, and go to a certain page. Once in a while, somebody would say they needed something, something recipe for something. And I would, I could go into, somebody asked me for, um, a, a beef stew recipe that was in Mrs. Welch's cookbook and I could go through and just without going up and picking it off the shelf, I could find the recipe in the chapter they were interested in. Gladly, it wasn't often that I got had to do those kinds of things. So I don't know, what can you do? The collection is still accepting things and it's being, because there are terrible space issues, in special collections, there are lots of limits to what they'll take. And you can call the Iowa State University archives. If you have things from your mothers, your grandmothers um, that are old and have significance to the state of Iowa, um, I would say make the offer because I think they're gonna get um, picked up. You can call me if you want, you can email me. I. I've made that access available to you um, in the handout so that you can do that. Um, because we're, it's, it's one of those things where it's still happening. Um, the future, 
besides being slightly unknown, I would say identify pre-1970 Iowa cookbooks. Or if your family has done a cookbook, even recently, that's full of historical pictures as well as recipes. I would say that those kinds of things should belong if you have a copy in the collection. And uh, those kinds of things will not end up in the general collection. They will end up in, in archives. Um, the other thing I thought you might be interested in, and I'm gonna kind of wind it up with that so that we can have a few questions. There are other, other of these kinds of collections around. And I'm most proud of this one because Michelle Christian, who did all of the photographs for my collection, for my web pages, um, moved on to become the head of archives at South Dakota University. And she has created a South Dakota community cookbook collection, which is perfectly apt, which is really um, an active collection at this point. And, and so God love Michelle Christian for going on and taking something and building it somewhere else. Um, the University of, of Wisconsin has a wonderful recipe collection from the uh, from the war. And I would recommend it highly if you're looking for that kind of historical or ethnic information um, for something that you're working on. And I can't emphasize enough to people how valuable the Library of Congress is in doing research on historical um, materials. And they have a huge community cookbook collection, which has mainly been digitized. It's available from their main, in their main, um, if you go to their main digital page, um, you can find these collections and all of the things like cookbooks by place, by time, all of those things have been done and, and they've done the work and you can see what's there. Um, Texas Christian Women's College has a wonderful culinary collection. A collection that I was involved in putting together, um, the Home Economics Projects from, the, from, from Cornell University in New York is called Hearth, and it was set up to archive home ec related materials actually and agriculture related materials from all the states and it includes thousands and thousands of items that they digitized and, and added to that collection. And that's what the current homepage looks like. And Michigan State has a huge project called Feeding America, which is historical cookbooks from the 18th to the 20th century. And this one has, this is my bonus page. Um, if any of you in doing your genealogical research is interested in seeing those county histories, which are often called atlases or any number of things, they're all available full text from that other university and it's called Iowa County Historical Atlases, if you haven't run into that collection. And with that, I'm gonna round up and say, does anyone have any questions? If anybody prefers to put their question in the chat, please do that as well. Diana, how many uh, volumes are in the collection total at Iowa State, would you estimate? I can't hear that. Uh, how many titles in are in the collection in total, would you estimate? Um, somewhere under 5,000. And that includes all of the ephemera. So we have lots and lots of, of little bitty things that are in the collection, like hang tags from Amana and that included recipes. That was sort of my dividing line. We have uh, 
a background of collections historical from Jello. Um, but yeah, I would say the total of all of those things might be between four and 5,000 pieces. And there is a question in the chat. What was the ladies auxiliary auxiliary farm extension cookbook? What was what? The ladies auxiliary farm extension cookbook. I, I still didn't get that. It's in the chat. If you can open it up, oh, you should be okay. able to see it. I can do that. What was the ladies auxiliary farm extension cookbook? What was it? I'm not sure what the question what what the what the question is asking. I guess. Um, one of the things in my presentation, something I didn't call that. Huh? It looks like they just missed the name. Maybe they provided some additional context. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, I got it. It it was called um, Cookbook Ladies Auxiliary. Um, it was an educational um, cookbook that was put out by the Farm Bureau or the predecessor of the Farm Bureau. The, but it was, and here's one of those things I guess I'm going to warn you about if you're looking at titles for things. Um, if you don't find it one way, look the other because cook, book, and then cookbook are, it could be one word, it could be two. Um, watch the, for the spelling, the old spelling of recipes often when you're looking for things. RE receipts is what it really looks like. If, if you're looking at it. Um, but the name on this, but it says on the slide cookbook. Um, and then unless I go back to my presentation, I don't know if I can tell you that. Let's see if we can do that. Um, tested recipes. Oh, what do you suppose? F, E, and C, U of A. <laughs> oh, and I don't have any more pages of it in my presentation. So Cooperative of America. Farmers Education Cooperative Union of America. The chat box is right over the top of what I'm, um, um, what I'm looking at. So uh, in the chat box. So is there any? That's the only one I see in the chat box. Does anyone else have a a question? Does anyone have anything they want to offer up from their own experiences? I love to hear what other people have to say, what their experiences have been with this kind of thing. Um, I know that people are, I'm start, have started putting recipes into my ancestry.com file um, by doing photographs of recipes or recipe pieces of paper and then putting them in the, in the digital photos so that I have a record of some of those things. If and when, God only knows, I really want to um, put something together that's actually in print form. I kind of said at the beginning, my mom just had her 97th birthday and I've been trying to put together a family history of her family for her. So I have a I comment. Yeah. So I have a comment. Um, okay. I'm so glad you're doing this. <laughs> Thank, you <too. laughs> Thank you. 
you and everybody else who has contributed to this effort, it's something that will, would not be immediately recognized as necessary. And yet it's something that has to be done now or it'll be lost. And so, and as you say, it's in process as we speak. Um, our, during our lives, lifetimes, um, the techniques and um, abilities of cooks have changed a lot. And um, I'm not sure when people will be going back to the old recipes, but um, at one point, I don't know if you know uh, Claire Keller, he was a, a professor and taught um, American history at Iowa State. So for our church auction, I had an idea to do a, a George Washington dinner. So Claire was gonna come in his costume that he had gotten a grant for and be George Washington. And I was gonna cook um, a colonial dinner. So <laughs> I hit the library for all the books I could find. And of course, you know that these recipes were not in the form that we would expect now. And so it was really a challenge, but it was also a wonderful experience. I just really had a good time doing this. And I never could have done it if, if some people back in those days had not saved their little pieces of paper or special recipes and given them to their relatives and the relatives had treasured them. Um, you know, so you never know how these things are gonna be used in the future, but it's, um, it's in the possession, I would say largely of women. And women tend to denigrate what they do. And um, I think this is a time when we have to strike back and keep track of what we've been doing. Well, and in case you're sort of getting the idea by my word book, that things have to come as something that's a book, that's in nice condition, you're absolutely wrong. There's more than one set of cooking recipes from somebody's grandmother, great-grandmother or not. It came in, um, you know, gift boxes from Yonkers or, um, and, and we saved them in toto as they were. We didn't try to make a book out of it. We didn't do anything to it. We just saved it as was. And, and so people can someday come and historically look at these things the way they actually got kept in grandma's kitchen in a box. <laughs> and uh, so, but you know, it's that handwritten thing. One of the things that happened when the cookbooks came from Robert Smith is that while I was looking at all these things at his garage, um, I was taken with all of the little things like my grandma did where you pasted something in with a piece of tape or or you stuck it in and it was a comment about some recipe that was actually in the book. But I was so excited to see all of those things and thinking that we would have them. And one day before the books actually arrived on campus, I got a box in my office and I opened it. And one of the people who worked for me was there when, when I was opening it and I just started to cry. And she said, what's wrong? And I said, I said the wrong thing because Mr. Smith had gone through all of these old cookbooks and taken all these little pieces of paper out and put them in a box for me. And he thought he'd done a wonderful thing in saving the pieces of paper, not realizing that the pieces of paper don't mean anything unattached mm -hmm. from where they originally were. And <clears throat> for a long time, that box sat next to my um, my desk in my office, probably till I had to clean it out when I left. And uh, <clears throat> I had to call him up and tell him thank you <laughs> because <laughs> well, he didn't realize he didn't realize what he what he done was take the history away from the from the book that it was attached to. So yeah, things in their original state. And I too, Jenny, have tried to cook some of these things. And uh, it's wonderful fun. And it's kind of like trying to get my grandmother to tell, tell us what our, the recipe was for her food. Like bread was our favorite thing. And my sister and sister-in-law and I would sit day after day after day and watch her make bread because 
there were no measurements. And so the potato water was always warm on the cook stove. And, you know, we throw in so much yeast and so much sugar and so much, we start with a well of flour in the middle of a big bowl. She made bread every day, but she didn't have a clue what went in it. it just, as she said, when it felt right. <laughs> So never learned to make bread as well as my grandma, although I did make bread a lot when I was younger. Anyone another, else? I have another thing I'd like to add. Okay. Um, with this in mind, uh, when our children got married, um, I uh, got their invitation list and sent out to each person who was invited to the wedding um, a recipe card and an, a request to send in a recipe and or advice about marriage or family or whatever, and just uh, send it into me. And then I put it into uh, just really a, a loose leaf type of book for each family. And uh, they'd use these and it was, it provided a, uh, something that everybody could contribute to and uh, at no cost and was a, a really meaningful thing. We got poems and we got recipes and we got um, jokes and advice. <laughs> it was really fun. Well, yeah, I, I, I would, that's wonderful. I wish I had thought of doing something like that. I don't know why I didn't. Uh, I also just wanted to jump in off of something you said, Jenny, about people using these recipes. And uh, just to share that there are actually a number of YouTube channels out there that exist that use you know all of these resources that Diana has talked about to cook historical recipes. <clears throat> so there's a, a YouTube channel called Tasting History and he cooks everything from ancient to you know World War II uh, recipes. Um, there's a YouTube channel called Townsend's who focuses specifically on colonial uh, and uh, sort of revolutionary war cooking and often does it using historical cooking methods. Um, so if it's something of interest to you, there are definitely places to see these recipes being both cooked and tasted. <laughs> Sometimes seeing the reaction of the folks who cook them uh, is, is interesting. And I know um, I and some of our friends uh, in book groups, we uh, get together to discuss a book and often have try to have a snack or dessert or something that would be appropriate for the time of the book. That's a wonderful idea. Absolutely. Oh, we have a couple more chat things here, maybe. Yep. Uh, um, the answer is to the Iowa City one. Um, go to that other university where my son works in Iowa City. I always call it the other university, but um, the University of Iowa has a great collection, uh, not very many cookbooks, actually, but a digital, they do have a women's collection that has a lot of interesting things in it related um, to women in the state of Iowa. And some of it, some, it includes some of the same, some of the things that you would want, and maybe more for Iowa City, but yes, we do have Iowa City, and you can actually put if you're searching in the Iowa cookbook collection, you can do a search that's Iowa cookbook collection and a place name, and it will look for that place name in the record as well as that subject heading. So you could do like Ames, or you could do Iowa City, or you could do the county name, perhaps. Um, that kind of thing will show up because it's in the record of where, where it came from. And if you're, if you're looking for something specific and you want help, um, you might let me know because I, sometimes I, I know the tricks of the trade, as they say, and, and it, it might be a long path. Um, I have learned that many family recipes are really those food. You know what? That's that's an absolute truism, Lori. Um, we think we we started learning, 
using food people, better homes and gardens recipes. Those things started in the 50s, but I'm sorry to say that there were like branded foods and, and things that in the turn of the century, that would be the 19th turn of the century. Um, and people use those things um, in, their, in their food preparation, kind of like we do today. So what they could buy, um, they didn't make themselves starting probably about in the 1890s, although there's a little of it before that that I can think of in cookbooks, where they they bought something that has a brand name on it um, and used it in the recipe. So, so we aren't the only ones who do that. Um, hamburger Helper took those things and put them together. I don't know if any of you cooked for your kids with Hamburger Helper, but I did. It was survival mode <clears throat> when they were growing up and I was working. Um, I don't know, Lori, about the Italian immigrant community in Ames. And I know what you're talking about with the mines. Um, Ames Historical Society may have something I guess you're gonna to have to remember that nothing is always, I mean, nothing is gonna be everywhere. I mean, this, not everything is gonna be in the same place. Um, I think perhaps that's where I would go for that, with that question. Although I think as close as, as it is to Des Moines, you, it might be interesting to see what's in that Graziano um, cookbook the early recipes were all written in Italian. And there's a couple of examples in that cookbook. And, and the mining thing might include another um, ethnic issue and that's because a lot of the mine workers were also black. And so there are ethnic recipes that have that um, kind of background as well. Anyone else? Did I miss anything? I think you got everything from the chat. Okay. I was trying to keep an eye on it. Well, if there are no other questions for Diana, that was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, and we will see everyone at Genealogy Plus next month on February 15th. We'll be back in the auditorium next month. <laughs> and they got the handout, right? So there, if anyone wants to contact me, I think I put an email address on that. Thank you for asking. I did put a link to it in the chat. That handout can also be found at amespubliclibrary.org slash genealogy plus. So you can find it from there and all of the links are live. So it's a little bit easier to use it that way. All right. Thanks everyone for joining us. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you for having me.